Okay, good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for joining our webinar today on first steps in legacy planning. Um, my name is Jennifer Simon, I'm Director of Programs and Outreach at Surf Plus, the Artist Safety Net. Uh, Surf Plus is a national nonprofit organization that helps artists respond to, prepare for, and recover from emergencies. Um, a big part of our work is the importance of documentation um, in terms of your work and your records. And so uh, Meg Ostrom and Mark Leach, um, who is one of the presenters today, um, created Crafting Your Legacy, which is a free guide you can download and talks about um, how to document your studio assets. And uh, Beth Krebs is joining us today, our legacy specialist, who's going to talk about actually doc uh, inventorying and documenting your artwork. So I think we have a great balance. Um, we do want to thank the Wingate Charitable Foundation for um, generously supporting um, the Legacy Project and also the Joan Mitchell Foundation for um, helping us get the word out and for putting us in touch with Beth. Um, so with those intros out of the way, uh, just remind everyone the webinar will be an hour. It will be recorded and you will be able to play it back for free after the webinar. I'll send you a link with a short survey and um, a link to the webinar recording. Um, each presenter is going to have about half an hour and if you have any questions you want to go ahead and um, either you know post a question or put it in the chat section and periodically as the presenters present um, I'll read out some of your questions and if we don't get to all of them um, we can follow up with an email. Um, so with that being said um, I'd like to introduce Mark Leach. Mark take it away. Thanks, Jennifer, and I want to extend a welcome to everyone who's joined today. Thank you for your participation and for your interest in this important um, objective. Yeah, you know, I don't want to spend time introducing myself so much as to get into the topic at hand and also invite those of you who are on the webinar to look at my LinkedIn page if you need more information about me and my background. Um, so let's get started. You know, my uh, contribution today, I wanted to just outline briefly the purpose of legacy planning, um, its rationale, why you do it, and what ultimately you can gain from it, um, what assets are available to you as an artist to help you through this project, and what kind of results you can expect to achieve or might set as um, objectives for you through this process. And there are many, and so you know, even those um, which you might think about that aren't covered in the webinar are certainly valid and you ought to give um, due consideration to those ideas as you think through your own journey and developing a legacy plan. So uh, why legacy? You know, for me, I, I wanted to talk to you about legacy through the lens of being a museum curator, which I have been for 30 years and also a museum administrator. And so as I think about legacy, I think about it from a very holistic and integrated um, perspective. Um, you know, legacy for me, um, if you look at it from a museum's perspective, really is about um, collecting and uh, co collating the kinds of information that's available to help create a vivid picture for the work that a museum might own and that reflects an artist's um, best achievements. And so, you know, when we go from a holistic perspective into assembling a collection that reflects a particular vantage point on an area, a topic, a technical um, development or evolution, um, and an artist's uh, thought process, ideation and um, design and into uh, development and ultimately um, the conclusion of an artist's uh, ideas through the work itself, um, all of those things are really important. So why is it important for you as an artist? You know, I know that we all tend to, and I'm an artist, by the way, myself, though I don't tend to make a lot of it. Um, I have spent a good bit of time as a ceramic artist, and I also do a lot of drawing and painting. So I'm fairly versed in, you know, the whole process of creating, um, actually making things. And, um, you know, I wanted to talk to you all about why you should think about your own work um, and why you should want to preserve the work that you've done and how might you preserve it and 
ultimately, what does that mean? What does it look like to you? And so again, through the lens of a museum curator, you know, museums are about knowledge production. They're about doing the research, um, creating a context, um, developing a, a repertoire of uh, technical and conceptual information that is then delivered over a variety of different channels, whether it's digital or um, hard copy through a museum installation, through um, a variety of different technological um, devices and um, media that are available to museums today. And really, it's about public education, in my view, um, or from my view. I think of all that a curator might do as a charge to help explain and to bring um, into the light the kind of complexities and nuance that are the creative process itself and how each artist uniquely uses his or her own perspective and experience and outlook on the world as tools to bring into material presence the, the things that we all create. So public education to me is a really important part of that. And you know, I have to say as a museum person as well that I think we've all done a disservice by um, making the creative process something that is beyond the, the average person, the lay public. And you know, creativity shows itself across every walk of life. Um, doesn't matter who you are as a person. And so my, my really um, biggest goal as, as a person still um, working in the cultural sector is to find ways to connect um, the public with the really amazing qualities of creativity and to help people see creativity not as an end result, but as a journey. Um, and it's through public education in the museum, um, in an art center, in a uh, college or university, in a K through 12 setting, all of those um, environments are places where education can bring to light the specific aspects of uh, culture and creativity, and ultimately then to preserve that. Um, what we do and what you will do as artists who, if you decide that legacy planning is an important step for you in your career, is to preserve those special things that you have made, the ways in which you have worked in order to achieve them, ideation, you know, how you came upon the ideas that drove you in this particular creative direction, and then what kinds of tools um, were available to you to create it, or maybe you had to actually fabricate tools yourself or create tools that didn't exist. All of those things are important. Um, and I constantly use um, Gerhard Richter as a, an example of a remarkable artist who saw the squeegee as a tool that, believe it or not, and you, many of you, if not all of you, know um, the German painter and the nuance that he brought to the squeegee and the surface of a canvas and deploying uh, painting media across it in such remarkable ways to create expressive results. So uh, those are just a few of the things I wanted to impart today in my presentation to help you all see the, the rich potential of what you do as artists, how you do it, how it might be used to help um, people remember your unique um, creative uh, presence throughout your life and why it's important and valuable, valuable for you to preserve it. You know, we talked a good bit in the workbook about non-artistic assets. And so I wanted to speak briefly about that. You know, all artists, irrespective of what kind of um, work you do, you have tools and equipment and raw materials, other resources that you use in the service of your creative endeavor or process. And ultimately that you may use in marketing your work, bringing it to the public's attention. So those are really for us, the non-artistic assets and part of what we'll be talking about today and the value that they have to you both intrinsically and materially um, in the possibility of helping you to create a legacy plan. So non-artistic assets, you know, in the workbook, we talk about how important it is 
to create an inventory of your tools. You know, for many of you, um, you know, the day-to-day -day journey of working in the studio is the essential objective. Um, you don't necessarily think about tools in the way um, that you might if you were, um, you know, a business where you had to amortize the expense of tools over a particular period, or if tools were damaged or lost in a fire or, you know, um, event that compromised your business capability. The tool inventory is really important for those reasons and a good many others. And so I wanted to urge you um, to really give consideration to creating an inventory. Um, the inventory that uh, Beth is going to talk to you about here in a bit is certainly an essential part of a legacy plan because first you have to know what you have. Um, and for me as a museum person, I wanted to talk about how animating your tools for the record can be an essential part of what we understand as your legacy, creatively speaking. So when I say animating, what I mean is that you use your tools in a particular way. You use them in a, an episodic and periodic way in your work. And so how you do that, when you do that, the effects that you create and the results that you achieve are important to record in one way or another. And again, I'll cite Gerhard Richter, though you could look at David Hockney. Um, there's a remarkable um, hour long video of Hockney and his work in the Wolves in England, um, or Richter and his work in the studio with a, um, a squeegee and the heroic scaled paintings that he creates. I mean, there's all, any number of artists that you could look at who have had the privilege of having their work documented and the, the nuance that is involved in the day-to-day -day, um, use of tools in that pursuit. And how you use them is an important aspect that you can use to pass on to interested younger artists who are moving into the field, who are literally in a stage of learning. But at the same time, there isn't a museum person alive that I know of who hasn't had um, the opportunity to speak to the public and for the public to pose one essential question. How did they do that? And so there isn't so much, um, oh, I guess I've, I've, I see the, the balance and scale tipping from one side to the other from you know, the, the uniqueness of an artist's voice. Um, and how the toil in the studio has enabled that person to achieve a particular kind of result in the, the primacy of the author, so to speak. And on the other side, um, having a transparency in that process that enables the public to bear witness to the uniqueness of that voice, but at the same time to learn that labor is an important part of any um, human endeavor. And precision and expertise and craftsmanship, whether it's with a paintbrush or with a potter's wheel, um, all of those things are essential for you to bring to life in your legacy planning and thinking. And so animating the way that you use your tools and attaching that to a tool inventory, to me are important objectives. And I want to encourage you today to think about those things for some of you, you may think that's just way too much effort. I get that, I understand, and I appreciate your perspective. For others, it may be something where you've been doing this naturally since you've been working, and it's just a matter of connecting the dots between the content that you have and the tool inventory. Because those things then become research opportunities for uh, curators, for faculty, for the public at large, as they become curious about particular techniques and processes. So now um, I want to turn for a moment to um, the intrinsic and material value of your tools. Well, the intrinsic value for me has to do with the way in which you um, use the tool itself, as I've said, in animating um, your tools. It also has to do with the unique results that you create using your tools. And so I would not be bashful about digging in and trying to find ways that you think are appropriate to help
people see the intrinsic value of the way you use your tools. And the material value is another um, aspect altogether, and that's really at the heart of what the non-artistic asset um, workbook is all about. You, know, you may purchase a particular tool um, on, the, on the market, and it may have an original purchase price, and over time, wear and tear are going to erode that um, um, immediate value or original value. That said, there is still value in the tools that you own and use to make your work. Uh, that is indeed part of what I think will ultimately be rolled up into a tool inventory. Because if you think about it, say for example, you had a studio fire or you suffered a flood or a tornado or hurricane, which have happened, um, unfortunately destroy your creative capabilities and you lost your studio and tools. Your insurance, if you have it, and I hope most of you and many of you do, is really, your adjuster is going to want to know the expense of all of this material and how um, to figure out what kind of a reimbursement your insurance adjuster is going to provide in order for you to get back to starting your business again or your creative capabilities. So those are really important aspects of the material value. And certainly, I will talk a little bit later about how the material value of your tools becomes an important part of the capitalization of a legacy plan. And that actually is the next step here, talking about an estate plan and the disposition of your non-artistic possessions. You know, your possessions are your studio, real estate, you know, vehicles, um, tools, um, materials that you own, and they all have some value one way or another. Um, some may have more, some less. And it may well be the case. I know an artist, for example, who is one of the uh, case studies in the book that we've created. They said, Mark, you know, I'm a very low impact kind of artist. I use very few tools. Um, and, you know, to be honest with you, I don't really have much in the way of tool um, expense that would be something I could capitalize and pour into a legacy plan. That may well be the case for many of you today, and, and then again, it may not. Um, that said, it is one of the aspects of your working studio that you need to consider as you look at options for estate planning. And I guess the most important thing is, at some point, we all will experience our demise. And um, how we think about the possessions we have um, the artwork that we've made, but especially the non-artistic assets that we um, own and what to do with them once we have passed, it's important to take that into consideration and to really create a plan for the afterlife, we call it, of um, all of your possessions. And so to do that, you first have to know what you have and what its value is. And so those are aspects of the, um, the workbook that are spoken to in great detail. And I want to encourage you to download the workbook from SURF's website um, and give it some attention. So now materials, you know, what, what are the materials you may have in your studio? Well, uh, these are uh, photographs that I've taken during my career as a curator and director. And um, the left image um, is an image of uh, the Czech artist, Stanislav Lubinsky, who's deceased now. And his wife, Yaroslava Brichtova. Those are actually the glass panel colors that they use, it's their palette. Well, you know, there's intrinsic value there and so far as here's artists who have actually really looked at the palette that they think is vivid and expressive of their particular vision of architectural glass and sculpture. Um, the top right is a, a studio shot of Roy Superior, who is deceased and whose um, surviving wife Mara is a ceramist. You know, this uh, molding looks to be really scrap, but in fact, it actually is a good bit more than that. And while it may have no monetary value, it certainly may have value for artists who might find it um, important to use in their own work. And so thinking about that aspect of 
um, some of the material value, material possessions that you have in your studio, I'd encourage you to look at it broadly and to give it consideration. And then finally, the bottom right is uh, a, a remarkable um, repository, if you will, of thread that is uh, part of the Australian tapestry workshops uh, material uh, that they use. And you can see a, a really amazing palette of thread. Um, and that is just another example of what materials might be that you ought to consider. And tools and studio contents. Um, you know, one of the things that I get excited about as a curator is how artists think, the tools they use, and where they draw their inspiration. Um, when I was in Tokyo um, jurying the Coats and Bamboo Prize, um, I visited an artist's studio on north of Tokyo, and you can see on the left a, a beautiful um, series of persimmons that are um, drying, they're hanging by thread. Well, you know, they may actually not be relevant to the untrained eye, but to the eye that knows about bamboo and how bamboo can be dyed a variety of different colors, you begin to see how the artist drew his attention to the ways in which organic color and decay create a palette that for him was very inspirational. Um, by the way, we acquired a piece from this artist and it is at the Mint Museum of Craft and Design in Charlotte. On the top right is a um, studio shot of Roy Superior's studio um, in uh, Massachusetts. And you'll note that there are a number of tools, knives, that are made of horn. These are all individual tools the artist handcrafted himself. So an example, not simply of tools that you would buy on the open market in a hardware store, but in addition, tools that he actually created and that in some way, shape or form, provided a unique experience for him as a creator. And I would um, argue the results are unique too. And then finally below on the right is a, a studio shot of the glass sculptor Dan Clayman in Providence, Rhode Island. And you can see molds and a variety of different machinery and equipment, all of which has some value. Uh, whether it's monetary or intrinsic. And so, again, I wanted for you to see like a broad range of things. And in the case of the persimmon, to really think of um, that as part of your creative journal, if you will, what things inspire you and how important they are uh, to capture as you think about um, leaving a legacy that people can learn from and uh, appreciate. Um, from your unique perspective. Hey, Mark, just wanted to let you know you got um, five minutes. No worries, I'm coming up on the end. I figured you were pacing, <laughs> okay, great. Yep, so ultimately what I wanted to really talk to you about is the fact that you are not simply a maker, uh, an artist, a creator, but you are also a steward of your own creativity and the many ways in which you can be a steward is the, the balance of my presentation today. By the way, this is a, a shot of the inside of the Australian Tapestry Workshop in Melbourne. But I wanna ask you now, each of you, how do you wanna be remembered? Do you wanna be remembered as a maker, a thought leader, a critic, a mentor, somebody who took young artists under your wing and helped them to grow in their own creative pursuit? or to pass along heritage of your own experience to another or to a group, or whether you wanna be an organizer, a catalyst or a disruptor because you see things from a different perspective. All of these things are important. You may want to be all of the above or just some of the above. And there may be um, uh, roles that are missing from this list and I suspect there are, but that said, I think the question is to really think hard to yourself about if you're interested in leaving your legacy behind and working on this from a, a legacy perspective, how do you want to be remembered? And what are the assets you have that can help to create that kind of living memory? And then finally, um, you know, what are your legacy options? How can you leave a legacy that can 
help people to remember your special role as an artist? Well, you know, you can, if you, over your career, you've accumulated a library, for example, you have ephemera as an artist notes or letters between artists that reveal certain creative conversations, things that would give insight into your own unique process or a way in which you've influenced or been influenced by a particular body of thinking. Um, giving that material to an archive in your area or thinking about the, um, the National Archives in Washington, D.C., the Smithsonian, that's one particular way. Depending on the assets you have and the value of the property that you might have at your disposal, you may consider, as some of the major artists have, like Robert Rauschenberg, Andy Warhol, and others, creating a foundation, and that foundation having a unique um, mission to support of various aspects of creative work. One of the uh, case studies um, in the workbook, the artist and his wife actually wanted to um, support artists who were emerging artists, but they couldn't do it by themselves. And so they forged a partnership with a public um, community foundation and others who saw potential in young artists. So that, that's another way to do it. You know, scholarships in um, your name for um, school, um, college or university, for example, or if your work is sought by a museum or museums, you may want to negotiate um, a, a deal in which you transfer a particular body of your work and that work is um, named in a museum collection. And finally, for many of us who um, create but are not potentially at the level that would um, be for a museum collection, you know, there are so many worthy settings in which your work can um, take on added value. And I would cite one particular collector um, here in North Carolina who has given a lot of his work to the hospital in which he practiced um, cancer um, recovery. Um, it has in many ways influenced the patients who uh, have been treated and he even had it in his office. Um, you know, you could give it to schools, public schools and libraries in your area to create um, moments of respite and um, to uh, provide settings in which people can reflect and recover. There are so many different options and these are just a few. And finally, I wanted to say, there, here's the, the legacy workbook that we created. You can access it at surfplus.org and it's intended to be used as a supplement for other guides on legacy and estate planning. And that's it. Well, thank you for your time and attention, and uh, I'll turn it back over to Beth and uh, continue on. <clears throat> Hello. Um, so I'm going to pick up. Uh, Mark has addressed a lot of the benefits of doing this work of documenting your career. Um, I would just add the scenario, if you could ask yourself, could someone other than you locate, ship, or install your work without you there to direct it? Um, or possibly, um, if you're asked for images of a project you made years ago to be included in a book, could someone else do that work in your place? Um, so the, those are some scenarios that um, you might find yourself in and that documenting your career would um, enable that to happen without you necessarily directing the work. Um, so just a little bit about why I can speak about this work. Um, I was trained as a legacy specialist for the Joan Mitchell Foundation's call program. Uh, and from 2011 to 2015, worked with a few artists to document their careers. And just briefly, CALL, um, Creating a Living Legacy, is an initiative of the Joan Mitchell Foundation that was created to address the needs of older artists. Um, and each, work, each artist I've worked with has a pretty unique practice and consequently the process of documenting their careers looked pretty different for each person and would likely be different um, for you or your loved one's um, artwork. 
So a first step in this process, um, here's, here's sort of a, a breakdown of what the steps in documenting your career might look like. Um, I'll just give you a minute to look at that. And that stage one step is where we'll start. And um, that is a super important step. I know sometimes um, those of us, you know, we're, we're making work and promoting that work as artists and, and this whole process of documenting our career is yet something else we're supposed to find time for. Um, I would really encourage taking the time for that first step of setting goals before you launch into this process. Um, and I'll just share us um, in my work with a couple of different artists. Um, I did a much better job working with the second artist I worked with um, than the first with setting goals. Um, I think the first artist we just launched into starting to document all these different pieces. Um, and it can be a pretty overwhelming process, um, particularly if you've been making work for many years um, and have a lot of it to document. Um, if you, you know, if you were only going to document four pieces of your work, like which would those be? Um, that kind of thing, um, starting with, starting there rather than with the goal of documenting everything you've made. Um, and also, that first piece of taking the time to reflect on your career um, is actually some of the more rewarding part of doing this work. Um, so the stopping and reflecting um, bef and then making goals from there is um, sort of my number one of three takeaways that I have for you today. Um, to take that time to reflect, identify one or two top priorities, and then break them down in this SMART goal. So making them specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, and timely. Um, so the second step, that stage two in this career documentation process um, is sorting your physical inventory. Um, this might be something that you've done all along and you're in pretty good shape with, or it might be something that you need to take the time to do. Um, it's important that your work be archivally stored, um, that, that some, again, could someone else find a piece of yours um, based on the information you're leaving? Um, so that, and, and just to say that that physical inventory includes the artwork itself, as well as archived materials, and then the tools like Mark shared a lot about, um, all of that is considered the physical inventory. Um, so archive materials could include things like project proposals, catalogs, um, press reviews, and then again, tools. And again, um, just start, start small. Maybe it's a section of your studio or it's a flat file drawer you're going to start with um, and, and, and work from there. Um, so next, part of the archive, so there's the physical inventory, and then there are the records that track that physical inventory. And there are a number of ways you can do that. Probably most of you have one version of this or another, whether it's information in a notebook or an Excel spreadsheet or possibly a database system. Um, there are some advantages to a digital archive or database, mostly that it is searchable in a number of ways. So you can, for example, find all of a certain kind of work. Maybe it's all your clay sculptures. You can find um, all the works easily that were a part of an exhibition. You're able to group and link these different records so that it's searchable in a number of ways. Um, and that linking step is stage four in this in that wheel of the steps. So stage three, you're creating the, the records, defining your system. And then later, once you have that information in, in your format, then um, in, in whatever database format you choose, then you can link those things and make it very searchable. Um, important that your digital archive is only useful if you can use it. So if you're someone um, who maybe finds 
technology challenging better that if your spreadsheet is working for you use that um, or or get help again that's going to be my another takeaway <laughs> for you all today um, that getting help so um, you want to you want to have a archive that makes sense for you and um, that you can use so a little more about archives um, what what your archive your digital archive could would typically contain um, the artwork itself information about that artwork um, exhibitions contacts including you know institutions that maybe have your work in their collection or um, individual collectors um, and then documents which could include you know your exhibition announcements correspondence reviews proposals things like that and then also here, you know, tools and equipment could also be really important for some artists. Um, and then for that artwork, um, here's, here's what an example of an artwork record in a digital um, archive could look like. And this is a, this is one of, this is the work of Arlen Huang, who's an artist I work with through the call program. Um, so, each digital um, database software, well, this will look different depending on the software you're using, but typical is to include, um, you know, the, the title, the year it was made, what type of work it is. Um, there's usually information about location. Um, general notes here, like size, dimensions, of course, that collector, if it's signed or not, all of these different things. And then, of course, an image of the work. Um, You'll see for this particular database, if you look at the tabs across the top that read right now, we're looking at general information, which is underneath the title of this piece is 100 Smooth Stones for Grandfather. There are other tabs there, so you can have additional images of this installation, information about um, the, uh, where, what this piece might be linked to. So maybe this is linked to the exhibition that where this piece was shown or linked to a second piece that was also shown at the same time. Um, you can also include a really important here again, and this kind of touches back to some of what Mark was sharing. Um, you know, what is essential to this piece? If someone else were going to recreate this piece after you've passed on, what are the non-negotiables that would be important to put um, so that again could someone else come in and install this piece for you um, and it would be true to your vision of the piece okay so this is a lot to look at here um, but again this is one example of an artwork record that is part of a digital archive um, Really important, sorry, I'll go back here. I didn't mention this, I didn't call this out in particular because I was gonna go more into detail, um, but coming up with an inventory numbering system for your work um, is a really critical thing. Um, you want to be able to track that work. So if you're looking on this artwork record, it'll be on the top left corner, um, under title, year, um, medium, there's a main inventory. And that's, that's the sort of almost acts as like a bar, barcode for your work. Um, and it has some information embedded in that number. And I'm gonna um, look at that a little more closely. Right now, you see here are examples of where that numbering system shows up. Um, each piece should have that on the numbering system or on the piece itself. So it could be on the stretcher bar or the reverse, the canvas, you see that JM. 99 PG 001. Um, it's, it's on the packaging of the work. It's as much, you don't want that number to be separated from the work. So that's almost, like I said, like it's barcode. And then that is going to link um, into the digital archive. When you're, some, some ways of starting to think about that inventory numbering system for yourself. Um, some things that that help when you're coming up with that inventory numbering system. This is a, a, an example. So um, you can start with the artist's initials. Mine are BK, so I started with that as an example. 
Um, the year the work was made, say it's 2002, you can go 02. DW is um, an abbreviation for drawing, and it's number four. So um, that is sort of you useful things to do with the inventory numbering system is to alternate numbers and letters. Um, that generally makes it easier to read. Um, you don't want to use symbols here um, because computers tend to have more trouble with dashes and underscores. Um, so, so it's good to keep those out of your inventory numbering system. Um, let's see. Um, you kind of don't want that number to go on and on and on. So that's why the abbreviations help if um, Oh, and the last thing, the 004, I wrote this in the notes here. Um, these don't have to be chronological because it's hard if you're going through your um, storage space, chances are you're not going to be entering the, like the number that you give to something is not going to be its chronological order. Like I might not be um, numbering the fourth drawing I made in 2002. It just means that 004 should just mean that's the only number four piece made in 2002, regardless of whether it's a drawing, painting, et cetera. And if this is going too fast, um, I'm going to give you a link to a resource that goes into this in detail. Um, it's the Career Documentation Workbook from the Joan Mitchell Foundation. That's a free downloadable workbook. And that has a whole section on this um, to reiterate and go into a little more detail than what I'm doing now. Um, so perhaps some of you are thinking about starting this process of um, choosing a software to manage your collection. And there are a bunch of different, um, there's different database software out there and some, and they all have sort of benefits and um, to, to weigh when you're thinking about this. Um, I, there are, um, there's collections management software that, you know, a museum would use. There's collections data, um, collection, collections management software that maybe a collector use. And then there's some that's more designed for artists um, to, to document their careers. So um, looking at those, you wanna, uh, a few things to consider. Um, does it have what I need in terms of content? Um, and again, what your needs are, are gonna look probably different than um, um, a major museum or um, you don't, maybe maybe whole sections on provenance and, and um, is not so important for you. There are sort of simpler and more in-depth um, collections management software. And you kind of wanna find one that, um, that fits your needs. Um, really important, if you're gonna go to do all this work, can you get your data out? So if, for instance, this, this software management company decides it's not gonna do any more updates, it's phasing itself out, can you get your data out um, easily is an important question to ask. Um, there are now, you know, you can choose between a cloud-based or downloaded software. Um, and the, you might consider, is it important that maybe you have an, insist, uh, an assistant who's gonna be working on this from a different location than you are? Is it important that multiple users be able to access this database from different locations? That would be possibly an advantage for a cloud-based software. Or, um, or do you live in a remote place with spotty internet and it makes a lot more sense for you to have downloaded software? You wanna kind of think about those things. Um, how do how does the software store images um, and documents? Sometimes uh, you want to make sure that they can handle high resolution files without slowing your um, slowing your system down. Um, how much does it cost? Um, it's Beth? great. To get rid of, yes. Oh, sorry to interrupt. Um, this is Jennifer. I just had a question. Sure. So. If you have documentation that isn't already in digital format. Um, like slides? Yeah, like it, this This kind of assumes that the, the work is already digital, right? Oh, so sure, yeah. Okay. Yeah, no, that's great. Um, 
both artists I worked with um, had a lot of their, a significant portion of their documentation as slides. And so one of the steps in sorting the physical inventory was um, taking those slides and scanning them and digitizing them. And there are services that do that for people. Um, and, and it can, you know, it, you can kind of, depending on how many slides you have to scan, how particular you, you are. I know when I was living in New York, there was a place that specifically did it for artworks and would um, clean the slides, kind of like get the dust off them and scan them all. And that's a service you can pay for. Or if you, you know, maybe you don't have a quantity of slides and you can get a, an intern or studio assistant to help that, help you with that. Um, but yeah, that's a reality for a lot of artists who've been making work for a while. Um, I hope that answers that question. Um, also, I'll just say the last, um, last thing to consider when you're choosing your software, if you decide to go that route is, how is the support for it? Um, so is there someone you can call and get help if you're having difficulty with their software or how, how, how is their customer service is an important question to ask. Um, okay. Um, then, so, okay, this is an overwhelming, can be an overwhelming process. Um, and so here are some first, first steps if, if you're starting out on this process is just take time to reflect. Um, it's, it's well worth your time to make an outline of your career and life as an artist. This could include um, maybe times you started new bodies of work or traveled and lived in new places um, and kind of identify which parts of this um, outline stand out as significant. And then, and, and this will um, help you kind of set, set goals. Um, again, you want someone else to be able to step in um, to this digital archive or whatever archive um, and have some sense of who you are as an artist or what your um, what your important what is significant for you and and again imagining someone else stepping into this and being able to locate your work understand something about it um, connect it um, to your sort of life story is an important part of this um, digital archive. Um, I, I wanted to go back um, for a second because my second step uh, takeaway um, or thing to encourage you all to do is regardless of um, regardless what else you do, <laughs> um, I would say a really important step is starting a habit of photographing, numbering, and signing each work before it leaves the studio. Um, if you do nothing else after listening to this webinar, from my perspective, I would say making sure no more work leaves the studio without you documenting, having that um, inventory number on it and signing it is a really important step. So um, that could, you know, if that is say this, let's say, that's going to be your goal leaving this workshop that you are not going to let any more work leave the studio before doing those things. Then perhaps we talked about smart goals, like how do you break that down. Maybe that means creating a little space in your studio that you can shoot the work, having a tripod available to shoot the work, taking a little bit of time to come up with what your inventory numbering system is going to be. Um, so again, these things might be obvious to some people, but um, I think breaking a goal down into like um, actionable steps is really helpful. So an example of a, maybe a smart goal might be that in, in a week's time, I'm gonna be set up so that I can document work before it leaves the studio. And, and all that might entail, like just making sure you have a camera there, that you have some decent lighting and a clear wall if your work is wall work or a little um, surface, a table or something if it's three-dimensional work. Um, okay. Um, my third sort of takeaway for you is, is to identify help. Um, I think a lot of times as artists, we do 
a lot of us do everything ourselves. <laughs> um, maybe you don't, good for you. Um, but identifying help, this can be an overwhelming process. Um, and um, so help might be, May, it might just be a buddy you can check in with periodically to set goals and share information. Maybe it's another artist that you can kind of meet with periodically to share information and help each other out. Um, maybe it's an intern or someone who is handy. Um, if you're not someone who's going to be able to build um, racks for your paintings, for example, you know, you probably know someone you could pay to help you with that. Um, or someone who can help you just wrap larger works that are hard to handle for one person. Um, maybe help looks like a supportive gallery or an ins institution um, that, that you have a history with that might have information about collectors for your work or, um, or for works you no longer own. Perhaps a gallery has sold some of your work and you weren't in the habit of making an inv inventory numbering system at that point. Um, perhaps an institution can help you get images or um, information about collectors. Um, and then another way to get help is to find an assistant um, legacy specialist or in an arts management company that can help you um, with whatever aspect of this is challenging for you. Um, I think all of us um, have sort of things that we're inherently good at and things that are hard for us. So identifying where you need the help. Maybe for you, it's just organizational. Um, your studio, you're super prolific and your studio has become like overrun with artwork. Or for, you know, for some of the older artists I've worked with, you know, um, mobility becomes an issue and um, it's just a little harder to get around and move things. So maybe that's where you need help. Or maybe um, it's the technology aspect of this that you need help with. Or maybe, you're just a really busy artist and you need someone to do this data entry for you um, because you just don't have time to be shepherding this project along. Um, so those, again, um, my, my three takeaways then, um, to, to take the time to set goals and reflect on your practice um, and start with like a single goal and then break it down into steps that are manageable. Um, the second takeaway, again, being to start the habit of shooting, numbering, and signing each work before it leaves the studio. And then the third takeaway is take a minute to figure out, like, what is the help you think you need and, and who you could do this with. I forgot to say, besides the physical benefits of help, like another set of hands, I think one of the most gratifying thing, things for the artists that I worked with on this project was reflecting with to someone else about um, their careers and life as, life as an artist. There's one thing to reflect privately um, about your work, but I think there's a big value in articulating that to someone else, like talking to someone else helps you figure things out. And so um, whether that's a legacy specialist or a fellow artist or a, someone in your family, um, that, uh, that chance to verbally um, reflect on your career is a really, has been a really rewarding and valuable part to this process for the artists that I've worked with and um, very nice for, for me. Um, I guess just one last quick thing. Um, make sure that as you're building this archive that you're communicating with someone, um, someone who you might think if, um, when you, when, make sure someone else knows, knows about your digital archive and knows how to navigate it. Um, again, if you're not there to, um, again, I guess if someone has to find some work and install a show for you and you are not present to do it, do they also know how to navigate this archive you've built would be an important, important thing to do. Okay, um, last thing. There are some resources that are free, downloadable resources made possible by the Joan Mitchell Foundation. Um, you'll find them at this web address, and it's a, a work, two workbooks, um, the Creating a Career Documentation Workshop and the Estate Planning Workbook. Um, and those are PDFs you can download and print, and um, they kind of 
go into more depth than what I can do in a, in a webinar. Thank you so much. Great, thank you Beth and Mark um, and everyone for joining us during this webinar. I think this information was really helpful and thought provoking and folks came away with some tangible steps they can take um, as a result of attending. So um, later today, as soon as the webinar recording replay is available, I will send everyone a link along with a link to a short survey so we can find out what you thought of the webinar. And I want to thank you very much. Be sure to visit our websites, surfplus.org and the Joan Mitchell Foundation. And uh, we hope you join us for our next webinar. Take care, everyone.